train on the space. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Oh, I don't even have it on there. Happy birthday to you. shape or form a special birthday. <laughs> Maybe it's his 21st. Maybe not. Okay. All right. So, uh, Wolfgang, happy to be on top. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? You did the pre-lecture reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seriously, seriously. So we do have we do have some important stuff to get through. So um, if Wolfgang can't keep it together, we'll have a proxy. Okay, so last time we introduced um, quantum chromodynamics. We talked about the Feynman rules, drew some of the vertices, um, talked about some of the new elements that we're going to encounter over and above what we did with QED. And as promised, it's already looking complicated. So today we're going to get into some calculations, and um, and it's going to be a, quite a different sort of discussion than what we did with QED for reasons which will become apparent. Um, but just to sort of give us a, a roadmap of where we're going, um, there are sort of two things that I want to talk about um, as sort of objectives to explain today. The first one is um, why only color singlets for matter. So we want to kind of try and talk about why is it that quarks are always bound up in these mesons or baryons. Um, the whole class of those are called hadrons, by the way, if you see that word. So we want to try and see if we can understand this. And then a second question, which is, I think, a practical importance for anybody who's done some nuclear physics um, or who's just thought about the different interactions in the standard model is uh, why, why is QCD a relatively weaker than QED in certain situations? Okay, so what I have in mind is if I take two protons, you know, and put them like a meter apart, and I measure the electromagnetic force between them, and then I separately measure, and it's not clear how I do this, the strong force between them, the electromagnetic force is going to dominate. Okay? So why is it that we call it the strong force if in certain situations it's weaker than the electromagnetic force? And so we'll kind of get an answer to this uh, at the end of the, the talk. A lot of the actual honest calculations we're going to do are going to be more tied up in answering the first question. But the results will, will uh, bear on the second one. Okay, so, uh, so what I want to do to sort of address this first question is consider um, a, a, cal a calculation very much akin to what we've done for QED already with the Feynman rules for QCD. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about a meson, which, uh, as you're aware from that sheet I handed out, it's got a list of all the mesons that we've uh, detected is a pair of a quark and an anti-quark, and these don't have to be the same type of quark. One of them could be a, a red, or a, a, an up quark, and one could be a down quark. Um, but one of them has to be a quark and the other an anti-quark. And, um, and by the way, this does not mean that the, the meson is neutral, electrically neutral, right? If these were, if I took a pair of leptons and I had a lepton and an anti-lepton, well, I mean, okay, so neutrinos are, are chargeless, but if I took like an electron and an anti-muon and I took those together, that would form a charge zero state. But remember, the quarks are fractionally charged. Some are one-third, some are two-third. So if I take a quark and an anti-quark, I'm not always guaranteed the charge is going to cancel. So that's why we have charged mesons. Then we also have neutral combinations as well. Okay, um, and what I'm going to do is I want to sort of take two quarks and I want to consider a scattering event And this might seem like a weird thing to consider because I want to talk about the two quarks being bound 
in a single composite meson. But for reasons we'll learn eventually, this is actually the right way to approach it. Um, but I just want to think about sort of doing a, a scattering calculation using these two quarks. So this, of course, is the quark, and this is the anti-quark. And then, um, you know, just to actually make this concrete, I'll say this is an up quark, this is a down quark. Uh, I'll have some momentum exchanged with Q, with the gluon that's going up. And then I'll label the momenta one, two, three, four. Okay. And so the process that we're really considering here is up plus down bar goes to up plus down bar. And um, although I'm treating this like a scattering event, really and truthfully what I'm trying to tease out of it is I have an up and a down, anti-down quark. How do they interact via exchange of gluons? And you know, I'm going to calculate some things associated with that. Now what we will eventually learn, just to, just to kind of make this seem a little less mysterious, is that when two quarks are actually bound in a meson or three quarks in a baryon, when you're talking about energy scales that are associated with the actual separation between the quarks and the meson or baryon, this is going to seem strange, but they actually behave like free particles. Okay, and this has a lot to do with how the strong force varies with energy scale. So to a certain degree, if I'm thinking about a down, a, an anti-down and an up that are bound as a meson, the idea of doing these scattering calculations where remember with scattering calculations and using the perturbative Feynman approach, these are free, these are free, and they only interact in this sort of intermediate place. That's actually the right approach, okay? So uh, don't worry, we'll get to the details of that eventually when we talk about renormalization. I just want to point out that even though this is a bound state, this is actually an accurate way or, or a reasonable way to approach it. And um, so, so let's actually just go ahead and use the Feynman rules and write down an expression for M. And I'm just going to skip to the answer because a lot of this is very analogous to what we've been doing for QED. And you know, there's some steps which we know we're going to have lots of delta functions. We're going to have an integral over that internal momentum. We're going to use a delta function to do the momentum integral. We're going to have an overall uh, delta function conserving momentum, which we erase and then multiply by i to get the expression for m. So uh, without any further ado, our expression for m is going to be i u bar 3. And then we're going to have the vertex factor now for the strong interactions, which is a little bit different than what we saw for QED. In particular, it's going to have these lambda elements in there. And then a gamma mu. Okay, so for QED, I wouldn't have this factor of 1 half and I wouldn't have this lambda. Okay? But otherwise, that's very similar to a QED vertex. And then I have a U1. So what I've done here is I have uh, traced this matter line back to this vertex and then trace this incoming matter line to create that spinner sandwich. And, um, oh, sorry, oh man, crap. Okay, hold on. I forgot a very important element of this is that I have to put in my color factors. So uh, the outgoing up quark is gonna have a color factor which is designated by C3 and since it's a, sorry, it's a bar. And since that's the conjugate spinner, it gets, a, it gets a dagger on its color factor. And then the incoming uh, matter quark is going to get a color factor C1. And then we're going to have a propagator for the gluon. <coughs> Looks similar to the propagator for the photon, except we put in this delta function. Uh, it's a delta function on the indices of the lambda matrices. Remember these lambda matrices are the generators of SU3, and I'll write them down explicitly in a few minutes if you don't remember their form. And then we just follow this matter line. This time we go on that incoming anti-quark, and it's going to have a color factor, which is remission conjugate, another vertex factor, and the outgoing anti-quark. Okay. So uh, just that's just straightforward following the rules of the Feynman rules for QCD. A lot of the elements here are the same thing we would have written if this was a photon being exchanged between charged objects. The new things are the C's. 
the factor of lambda, okay, and then this delta function here, right? Okay, so now here's the cool part, all right? Now remember, when we write expressions, it's always very, very important to pay particular attention to objects which we are uh, not explicitly using index notation for. Okay, so things with a mu or an alpha, well actually the alpha, well the alpha is fine because that's an index, that's an index. Using index notation, those indices, you can move those objects around. But in this expression, there are various places where things technically have components, but those components are not labeled. Now I need to find a person to ask to identify these very objects, these, and, and, and I think I might pick Wolfgang. Wolfgang, <laughs> of, of the various objects in here, which of them have indices which I have suppressed? So I'll start at the left. <laughs> Good. Yes. Yes, what kind of object is this? Spin. It's a spinner. <laughs> yes, it's a conjugate spinner, but yeah, so this has four components. What about this? Color. How many components does that have? Three. Three? Oh, man, you're doing really good. Uh, this? <laughs> no. This? No. This? Yes. What kind of object is it? <laughs> it's a matrix in what space? Spin. No. Draw line. Draw line. line. In what space? Space. Color space. In color space. So for example, how many dimensions would this have? Three. This would be a three by three matrix in color space. What about gamma? Yeah, this is a matrix in spin space. Okay? Now notice something very important. The lambda is non-trivial, but it's trivial in spin space, which means I can pull it out of a spinner sandwich if I like. For that matter, the C's are trivial in spin space, so I can pull them out of spinner sandwiches. In fact, if you think carefully, what I've really got here is a combination. Sandwich. It's a double sandwich. It's, it's actually it's a, it's a quartic sandwich. It's a sandwich in a sandwich and then next to another sandwich in a sandwich. It's awesome. It's a spinner sandwich with the U bar, the gamma, and the U, but it's a color sandwich with the C dagger, the lambda, and the C. So what we can do is we can take all those sandwiches and separate them, and we find an expression of the following form. And if you guys see me writing G mu nu, just tell me <coughs> and I'll write A to mu nu, because I got G in my notes and I forgot to correct it. So feel free to, to call me out on that. Okay, and then we've got this nice factor. Okay. All right, so really and truthfully, yeah, question. Is that a times one fourth or an X? It's times, times one fourth, times one fourth. Yeah, so, sorry. I like to go back to, to elementary school sometimes and explicitly remind you. And then we're going to multiply. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, and that's just coming from the factors of a half uh, in these vertex factors. The second lambda should be a beta, right? Uh, yes, this should be a beta, thank you. Didn't we lose that when we did the delta function? Uh, yeah, we, we did, yeah. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> damn it. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I had it right the first time. I mean, you could have convinced me I was wrong. Okay, yeah, so this delta function, you know, delta alpha beta is just going to grab these two indices and make them the same. You can make them whatever you want as long as you make them the same. Now, why in the world would I organize this in this fashion? So you can take the trace? Uh, well, actually, we're not going to go that far, okay? The reason I did it is for the, following, for the following observation. This quantity right here 
is exactly M for electron plus anti-muon scattering. If you, and we've looked at processes very similar to this, if you did a QED analysis of electron anti-muon scattering, QED, not color, not QCD, you would have ended up with exactly this expression. Yeah, other than the G would be for... Right, this would be GE squared, okay. So what that means is that all of the new interesting complex love of QCD is completely contained in this factor. And of course the one quarter is it's just a number, it's not that important. This factor is what we call the color factor. And our main interest at first is going to be evaluating explicitly this color factor. Now, don't get me wrong, at the end of the day, this is a number. Okay, we'll see, we'll calculate numbers from it. This, of course, is a very complicated object, but at the end of the day, we would do with this what we did with the amplitudes we calculated in QED. So this is M, we would square it, we would average over the incoming spins, some of the outgoing spins, use the trace theorems, and we could eventually reduce this to a number to shove into Fermi's golden rule. We don't need to repeat all that with the strong interactions because you know, at a certain point it all looks the same. So the, the thing I want to focus on now is this new part, evaluating the color factor. And what we're going to find um, is the following observation. One way to think about the scattering process of an electron and an anti-muon via a photon is you can think of this as some initial state so some initial state that's comprised of the wave functions of this electron and anti-muon, and, uh, or sorry, sorry, it's an initial state that evolves to some final state through some sort of potential interaction. So we could just, you know, write in some potential which is representing the electromagnetic interaction here. Okay? So you can imagine this is part of a Hamiltonian operator for this process and we're just calculating a transition amplitude and the fact that there's an interaction is being captured by the potential, okay, part of the Hamiltonian. Now here's the important observation. When we're giving an electromagnetic potential, what determines whether it's an attractive or a repulsive interaction? The sign of the charge, but moreover, the sign of the potential. Yeah. The overall sign of the potential, which changes if you consider two positive or two negative or a positive and a negative. Fair. So the point that I'm making is the following. This M is exactly what we would have written down for this interaction. Is this interaction attractive or repulsive? It's attractive. This is a negatively charged electron, a positively charged muon. Electromagnetically, they attract. So if this color factor is positive, this overall process is attractive. If this color factor is negative, it's repulsive. Okay? So asking whether these two quarks are attracted to each other or repelled from one another is essentially asking what is the color factor. And that's why we're going to focus on that. Now, with electromagnet, <laughs> I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> uh, uh, with electromagnetism, we don't, there's not really a lot of options because once you know the two electric charges, you're done. But QCD is a different beast. There are three versions of charge, each of which have two factors, or two, two, two values, charge and anti-charge, okay? So it's a priori not entirely obvious, for example, if I take a red and an anti-blue, if that would give me an attractive or a repulsive interaction, okay? So we're gonna depend on the color factors to tell us, all right? So here we go, we're actually going to explicitly evaluate the color factor. And it is going to be crucial for us to recall some useful results that we covered last time. And fortunately, we have someone to remind us of those very <laughs> valuable results. And it happens to be Wolfgang. <laughs> Wolfgang, 
If I am considering a state of a color and anti-color combination, I can break that down into a set of how many independent states? Eight. Nine. Nine, good. And but those nine can be broken down into what? Eight and one. Eight and one, good. So what we technically have is uh, my favorite kind of math. <laughs> We have that 3 cross 3 bar, which is clearly 9, is secretly 1 plus 8. <laughs> okay? So in the language of uh, product representations of groups being decomposed into a sum of irreducible representations of, group, that's, of groups, that's the way the math looks. That's why it was so cute that you asked me if this was a multiplication sign, because we know when you get to a certain level in physics, <laughs> things get even more sophisticated. But anyway. And what we discovered was that this was the set of colorful, colorful uh, octet states. And what I mean by colorful is that they transform non-trivially under SU3 transformations. And this was the colorless singlet state. And I wrote down kets for all nine of these last time. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to investigate this color factor choosing either one of the octet states and then separately choosing the singlet state. And the idea is the following. Okay, you ready? I'm going to give you the punchline before I dig in, get in the weeds so that you can kind of see where we're going. If these things are going to be bound into a bound state, a meson, should their interaction be attractive or repulsive? Attractive. It should be attractive. Now, last time we talked about how mesons, or any combination of quarks, should always exist in a color singlet state. So with that in mind, Wolfgang, when I calculate the color factor using the color singlet state, do I expect the answer to be positive or negative? Negative. Positive, positive yes, good. <laughs> it's one or the other. Yeah, because if I, I know that a meson can be a color singlet, so it should be attractive, and I want this color factor to be positive so that I have an attractive result. Conversely, what I'll find is when I use an octet state, for which I already know mesons should not be allowed to be in an octet, if I calculate the color factor, I'm expecting to get a negative value. Good. Okay, you, you identified what I was pointing at. All right, we're going down to base level stuff here. Okay, all right. So does everybody kind of understand what we're thinking is going to happen, and then we're just going to see it come out in the machinery? Spencer. Why, why do they exist in singlet versus octet, and what does that mean? Um, so first of all, we're, I'm going to give you some evidence why that's the case, because what I'm going to argue to you is that only for the singlet is the interaction attractive. Yeah. It would be hard to imagine forming a bound state from two things which are repelling each other. Right. Now that is, that is not a complete proof, and I'll get back to that at the end, but that's kind of, this is sort of the evidence of, or this is some motivation for why uh, we observe that. Okay. So here we go, let's just crank this out. Um, oh, good God, here we go. So I'm going to first start with the uh, octet state. And for uh, the octet state I'm gonna use, I'm actually gonna try and keep this really simple. I'm gonna use a state that's RB bar. Now that's not one of the octets that I wrote down, but of course any colorful state I can write as a linear combination of those octets, and so just to be concrete, uh, this would be this combination of the one and the two octet states that I wrote down last time. Okay, so I can use any linear combination of the octet basis states that I want, and this is just a particularly simple color assignment. Okay, so uh, just to make this concrete, I'm going to have this incoming up be red, and then this uh, is going to be the blue because this is going to involve anti-blue, so that needs to be the antiparticle, and red, so that needs to be the particle. And then for our color factors, what we have is the following. Okay, so Wolfgang, what would C1 be? 
So C1 is the color factor for this incoming up quark, which happens to be red. One, zero, zero. Yes, exactly. Sweet. Okay, so That's it. Okay. What would uh, C3 be? <laughs> what would C3 be, Wolfgang? Zero, zero, one. Why? Because C1 is Okay, so let's ask ourselves the following question. Um, how much color is coming into this process? <laughs> so it coming in, so listen everybody, listen, shh, shh. coming into this process there is RB bar color. What has to come out of this process? RB bar, color is conserved. So can this carry B bar? It's a particle, not an antiparticle. No, this is a particle and this is an antiparticle. So this has to carry the red and this has to carry the, the anti-blue. All right? But that means that C3 is exactly the same as C1. Okay? You follow? So you're asking a question? In yeah. this case, the mediating particle doesn't do anything to the color? Or? So the gluon, the gluon, okay, so for example, you could use that, uh, I think it's the eighth gluon, which is that weird combination of red, red bar, blue, blue bar, minus two green, green bar. Yeah. So that te technically doesn't have color, but it transforms non-trivially. We don't have to get too tied up in the details because the Feynman prescription is going to tell us the answer. But the, the, the bottom line is, is that gluons can change color, but they do not have to change color at a vertex. In this case, we know they don't change color because there's no way for overall color conservation to work out. We will look at processes where it changes color in a, in a bit. Okay. Okay, so uh, carrying on, what then would be C2, Wolfgang? Zero, one, zero. Yeah, zero, one, zero. And that would be the same as C4. Okay? So in our color factor here, we now have expressions for C1, C2, C3, C4. These are very simple little matrices, and we know how to Hermitian conjugate them. They're, they're real, so we just take the transpose, okay? So fleshing this thing out, my color factor, which I'll just call uh, F, to give it a name, F is going to be, uh, I'll have my one, one fourth just to, to get the numbers right, one zero zero, that's the transpose of C3, Lambda alpha one zero zero and then zero one zero lambda alpha zero one zero. Okay? So this is getting really concrete. Now remember these lambda alphas are the generators of SU3. So if I write some of these down, they're all going to be three by three matrices. They can be complex. Actually, we're going to write them all down. Won't take too long. Yeah. Is that a minus i of lambda two? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did somebody really ask me that from the very back of the room? <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Is there a, uh, is there a game going on where if you say something, then something has to happen? And that's why somebody's saying something? <laughs> no, no one's going to cop to it? <laughs> that is some weak sauce. I'll take, I'll take a swig for you. Spencer, is that you guys are really dense right now. So we can start plugging and chugging. Okay. All right. I can see it now. Okay. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay. So, so now let's, let's just think about this for a moment. What is this particular combination here going to do for each of the alphas? <laughs> That's spooky. Grab the first component? Yeah, it's, it's, on the, it's just going to grab the very upper left-hand component of the alpha. Okay? So this thing is really just going to collect 
lambda alpha 1, 1 for each alpha. Okay? What is this factor going to do? Yeah, it's going to grab the 2, 2 component. Okay? Now, alpha is a repeated index. What do we do with alpha? Sum. We sum over it. Okay? So secretly, this is a sum over alpha. All right, and now you can do it, okay? So if we actually grab all of these, notice a lot of them are zeros, some of them are ones, and we calculate this bad boy, and lo and behold, we find that this is minus one-sixth. Yeah? Um, are the C spinners in the color space? In what space? Color space. No, they're vectors. Oh, okay. But I thought we were using spinner sandwiches. That, so this is a spinner sandwich? This is a color sandwich. So color, color, color sandwiches are because we have objects which are non-trivial in color space, which is a three-dimensional vector space spanned by red, blue, and green. Spinners and spinner sandwiches and gamma matrices are non-trivial in spin space, which is a four-dimensional space, which is associated with four-dimensional space-time, but in a non-trivial way. It's the spinner representation of the rotation of the Lorentz group in four-dimensional space-time. So that's, I promised you at the very beginning of the semester, eventually we will be talking about like, you know, three or four different spaces in one single calculation. Color space is a new space to think about. Spin space is one we've been struggling with. And then, of course, there's space-time because there's muse. Okay? We still treat spin space and space-time as uh distinct spaces? There, there, so here's, here's the difference, okay? And th this is probably worth pointing out because you've, you've kind of worked with these enough. Spin space and space time are tied together because if you do a transformation in space time, like a, a boost, it affects this because that's a space time index and you also have to do a, a ro an associated transformation in spin space. Because they're both ways of thinking about how things change in space-time. They're just two really different ways of seeing it, one through spinner representations and one through tensor representations, okay? But if you do a rotation in space-time, color space doesn't give a shit. Conversely, if you do a SU3 transformation in color space, that has nothing to do with space-time. Mu doesn't care, neither does the spinners, okay? So they're literally two completely separate spaces. But spin space and space time are tied together in this wonky way. Is well, it fair to think of a spinner as a vector in spin space? Sure. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. So was charge unaffected by rotations, like by, by Lorentz boost? Because it seems like the amount of charge an object is observed to have depends on how fast it's moving with respect to you. Didn't yes. we? Yeah. No? When did we talk about that? You mean charge density? Oh, maybe that's what I mean. Yeah, because you can boost, you can boost and change the volume of a region. Oh, of a charge containing okay, region change the charge density, but the overall charge can't be changed. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I just added algebra, but can you go through the summation? Because I'm getting zero. It seems like there's a root three missing on lambda eight, or like. A root oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Sorry. You're right. You're totally right. You're totally right. I apologize. I just looked at the matrices and didn't pay attention to the coefficients. Yeah, there's a root, there's one over root three missing on that one. Uh, and that's the only one. Thank you for pointing that out. Does that fix what you're seeing as a problem? <coughs> I mean, it's, it's written in the notes. Like, you can, I've written out the various factors and added them together. I'm just trying to save time here. Okay, uh, so would it be fair to say that there's a <laughs> charge space? Right, because you, because you said a boost wouldn't affect charge. So does that mean that? Like, well, it's like a one-dimensional number line. Yeah, yeah. So you can think of it like the number line, like a one-dimensional space that has nothing to do with space-time. And then you're taking either plus one or minus one values on that when you either have a positively charged particle or a negatively charged particle. It's not a particularly interesting space because, you know, you can't really rotate in it. So the, the problem is, is that you want to think about... Um, so normally we think about transformations which sort of preserve the length of vectors. But if you're in one dimension and say that's the origin and I draw a vector like that, 
Now, you, you, we're not talking about translations. That's a separate kind of transformation. If I just think about what kinds of transformation can I do on that vector that preserves its length, well, there's no continuous. I can reflect it, but that's discontinuous. So you have to be in at least two dimensions for it to get interesting. And then color space is three dimensional, so it's that much more interesting. Okay, so, um, so any, any other questions about calculating this color factor for an octet state? And here's the cool part, and you get to do it in your homework. Um, it actually doesn't matter what octet state you pick. And remember, that's kind of weird because the octet states look very different from each other. But if you pick any of the octet states, you're going to get the same number. Okay? And that's a priori not obvious because, you know, these are going to have different places where the ones sit, and that's going to utilize different elements of these lambdas. Okay? But nonetheless, for any octet state you pick, the color factor is going to be minus one sixth. If it's minus one sixth, that means the overall interaction is repulsive. And what we have just demonstrated, at least to the level that we can apply this perturbation theory, is that if I have two quarks in a color octet state, they can't be in a bound state. Because they're repulsive, at least as far as this is applicable. Ariel. Does that mean the color octet states are Sure, yeah. I mean, the color octet states are related to each other by an SU3 transformation, which is the symmetry group of, this, of the strong interactions. So, yeah, there's a sense in which we would have expected it. The singlet state is special because it's invariant. It doesn't transform into anything. Okay, so that's why when we do this decomposition, that's why we write it this way. We get the one because it stands by itself. You can't actually change it. It just remains itself, but this eight gets rotated into each other under SU3. Did you just call this uh, perturbation theory because we're only using the leading order diagram? Or why, in what sense is this? I'm going to explain that in a bit. Oh. I'm going to come back to why this is only valid in certain circumstances. Okay. It's perturbation theory because um, I, I'm only calculating, yeah, I'm doing this leading order and saying that's kind of the answer. Okay. If for any reason I think I have to go to higher orders, or worse still, if I think that the higher order diagrams are more important, yeah. holy snap, then this definitely is not going to suffice. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. OK, so the next example um, is to do this in a singlet state. And I'm going to move a little bit more quickly through this, even though sadly it's, it's more complicated. But we've got quite a few more ideas to cover. So if I choose the singlet state, unfortunately, there's really no way to make it simple. Steve-o? I can't see. That totally makes sense why you didn't do it like an hour ago. It's <laughs> so, um, so Wolfgang, what does the color singlet state look like? Yeah, it's the thing that kind of looks like the magnitude of a vector in color space, okay? So this thing is invariant under uh, SU3 rotations, and now what we want to do is calculate the color factor using this state. Now this is a bit of a pain in the butt, because notice this is not equal to this. It's not a product of two things, like what we could do for the, for the octet. That's why the octet was a little more straightforward. These, each of these terms is intrinsically tied to the other, and it's not an overall product. So when we work with this thing, what we have to think of is something like the following. So first of all, uh, with this assignment here, my C1 and my C2 are going to be given by the following. So that's the red red, and then eventually I'll take this and I'll Hermitian conjugate one of them, and, uh, and it'll flip it to a row. Okay, and then the product C3 and C4 is similar. So what I'm saying is that the one quark and the two antiquark, okay, their color state is this combination of red, red, blue, blue, 
and green green and we'll make it we'll make these anti red anti blue anti green in just a minute okay so when I want to go and I want to form the spinner sandwich and calc or sorry not the spinner sandwich the color sandwich and calculate the color factor I'm going to get an expression that looks something like this so this is just copying that down uh, yeah, C3 dagger, and I'm just going to put the, the ones and the threes and the twos as subscripts. We're getting lazy. Okay, there's my color factor. I just, I just copied this thing down. The one, two, and three, four. I'm just putting as subscripts to make it easy. And now notice, here sits right next to each other, C1, C2 dagger. Okay? How convenient. Yes, I know. So if I want to do C1, C2 dagger, this is going to be 1 quarter C3 dagger lambda alpha 1 over root 3, and then I can just write this as 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then my lambda alpha C4. Okay? The garbage cans are killing me. Okay, and now what I can do is I can come in here and for my C3 dagger C4, I can replace this with C3 dagger in the state. One zero zero, and then this whole chunk, slough, slough, chunk, chunk, and then C four will be in the one zero zero, and then I'll do similarly zero one zero chunk, zero one zero plus, and then last but not least zero zero one chunk. 0, 0, 1, and everything gets multiplied by a 1 quarter. Okay? At the end of the day, though, it, even though it looks complicated, it's a number because it leads with a row, and then you got a bunch of matrices because these are going to expand into matrices. Okay? And then the lambdas are going to be a bunch of matrices, and then I'm going to finish it off with a column vector, and everything's going to collapse to a number. Okay? So uh, you can actually, if you, if you think carefully about which components of the lambdas this process picks out, you can reduce this to 1 12th lambda alpha ij lambda alpha ji. Okay. Which is, if you think about this, if this was a k, that would just be a product over two lambdas because a product in, in uh, index notation is ij, jk. Okay? So we would take the product of the two lambdas, but then we take the first index and make it the same as the second one. So what are we doing to the product? Tracing. We're tracing it. Yeah. So secretly, this is just 1 12th the trace over lambda alpha, lambda alpha, where again, this is a sum over alpha. So I'm squaring each of these matrices, adding them all together, and then tracing and multiplying by 1 12th. Okay? And at the end of the day, that's 4 thirds. Okay? As we expected. This is the color singlet combination of the quark anti quark. The color factor came out to be positive, indicating that it's an attractive interaction which is the kind of interaction we would expect would give rise to a bound state. And as we said last time, for two quarks to be in a bound state, they have to be in a color singlet configuration. If they're in an octet, the color factor was negative, and this is a repulsive interaction. Okay, now, um, before I go and address the limits of perturbation theory and the consequences for this, um, I'm very, very, I'm going to do a very, very cursory overview of the baryon case because it's got a couple of features that are different. It's got some nice Greek theory in it too. Um, but 
Uh, are there are there any questions about the the Maison case before we push on the variance? Yep. How do you use the nine cat to understand like the up and the down? Like I don't see what. So, so, so the fact that this is an up and a down cork doesn't actually factor into this calculation I'm saying at all. Like What's important is that this is a red cork and this is a blue cork and this happens to be an anti cork of some form. But it, it was in that was in the octet state. That was why you said it was red and blue bar, right? So, 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 okay. So I can take red and blue bar. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of see what you're saying. So yeah, when I work with the sorry. That's a good point. So um, maybe I should maybe I should say uh, I have to relabel this diagram if I'm going to analyze the singlet. But the problem is, and this is what's so hard about this, when you're working with this kind of color state, you can't label the legs of the diagram like this because this has got a little bit of red, a little bit of green, a little bit of blue. This has got red, this has got green, this has got blue, this has got red, green, and blue. And this, all of these factors are non-trivially combined with those factors. You can't separate them as, as a product. So it's, it's really kind of hard to label the diagrams when you're working with these kinds of non-factorizable states. It's just the reality of it. And unfortunately, it is really the reality because this is the only kind of calculations we should be doing for mesons is in these single states. So you just don't put color anywhere on the diagram? Besides the blue ones? Yeah, yeah, I don't even label the color for the glue ones, to be honest with you. Because a lot of times you just understand, oh, I know that has to be in a color singlet state, therefore I won't worry about it. And the truth is, is it, it wouldn't matter if you, if you did a calculation and you called this red and anti-blue, and then later you did the calculation and called this green and anti-red, you'd get the same answer. For sure. Because there's a symmetry that rotates red into blue into green. That's like the octet state though, right? Or well, the, the state, the states that transform. I, yes, I agree with you. Why are we even considering octet states? Well, we're not now. <laughs> we're not now, Ariel. Right. So, when you determine what C one was, for example, given that you can't label red, green, and blue for a single uh, color state, you can't external line. Oh, well, this is the singlet state. It's a red anti-red. So this, so. Um, uh, so C1 and C2 are the color state of this and the color state of this. I just can't write it as a product of two of a color anti-color state. They're they're entangled, for lack of a better word. So the C I can't look at this expression and tell you what C1 is. That's the point. And I can't tell you what C2 is. It's the same as if I give you a, a combination of spins in a in a in a two spin a half system. And I ask you, what is the state of the spin of the first of those? And you can't say. It's not a product state. Mathematically, what is that object though, C1, C2? Because you're like multiple. This is the state of the color of the incoming particles. I write it as a product here, maybe I shouldn't. You know, maybe this is bad notation, but because you only encounter with the dagger. Uh, well, then it's like either a number or a you're going to firmly appreciate this when you work through it in the homework, I guarantee you. So, um, okay, so let, let me very quickly blaze through the Baryon case. It is, in principle, a much hairier calculation, but it's got a couple of nice features. So with Baryons, um, two things change. Wolfgang, how many quarks do we have in a Baryon? Three. Wolfgang? Three. Three. Are any, do we pair quarks and antiquarks? Yes. No. Uh, it's either three quarks or it's three antiquarks. Mesons, it's always a quark and an antiquark. For baryons, it's always three quarks or three antiquarks. Okay? So in principle, we could do a calculation where we literally take three incoming quarks and three outgoing quarks. And we could do a similar calculation to what we just did. Okay? Let's not do that. <laughs> You can automatically tell that this is going to be a very high order diagram. Okay, because again, you've got to build it out of the fundamental QCD vertex. I don't want to go to that order. Okay, so we're going to approach this in a slightly different way. That's also a little bit misleading to try and calculate something like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider them in pairs. So we're just going to take a pair of quarks 
and calculate basically whether they experience a, a repulsive or an attractive interaction. And then we'll kind of repeat that for all possible pairs of quarks in this process. And so what we're kind of thinking of is we've got three things in this baryon. Okay, we've got a baryon here and we've got three quarks in it. If I pick any two of them, I should expect that for that pair, the interaction should be what? Attractive or repulsive? Attractive. Attractive. Okay? Because if I picked a pair and the, and the uh, interaction was repulsive, it's kind of hard to see how all three of them are going to form a bound state. In principle, it could, but it's suggestive that if they're really going to form a bound state, I should get attractive, attractive interactions between any pair of the three. Okay? Now, what's different about this calculation over what I just did was that this is a quark-quark calculation, not a quark-anti-quark -quark calculation. So what we're thinking about now is a calculation where we have a quark and another quark. And so we can go through and we can label all of the elements. And at the end of the day, uh, the factor of M is going to be a QED factor, where this QED factor would be, for example, electron electron scattering times a color factor, and the color factor in this case is going to be very similar to what we just had. Okay, where these assignments are one, two, three, and four. Okay. And of course we have to make an important observation that changed from last time. If this is electron-electron scattering, the QED factor represents attraction or repulsion. 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 Okay. So this factor represents repulsion. So this time, when we look at the color factor, if the color factor is positive, it's repulsive, and if it's negative, it's attractive. Okay. So it's opposite of what we had in the Maison case. All right. Now, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with trying to go and multiply a bunch of matrices, but I'm just going to kind of show you how we have to approach this, and there's some nice group theory in this. So when we did the... Oh, it's over here. So when we did the quark-anti-quark -quark case, we had a nice calculation that looked like this. However, now um, we're going to have a calculation that looks more like this. Okay? Because one of, these, one of these color states is not an anti-color state, it's just another color state. And it turns out that the calculus in this case looks something like this, where it works out, okay, 9 is 6 plus 3. This is going to be uh, the anti-symmetric triplet. And... Yeah, and this is going to be the symmetric sextet. Okay. I just want to make sure it was, it was symmetric. Okay, so just to give you an idea of a state that's in the triplet, I'm not going to write them all down, um, but this includes, for example, a state of the following form, uh, RB minus BR and others. That is, it's anti-symmetric if you exchange the two colors in the state. So if I switch R and B, that gets a minus sign. Okay. Um, the sextet is going to include the symmetric combination. Okay. Clearly, it's going to have as many of these combinations as this does, but it has three extra ones. What are the three extra ones? Yeah, red, red, green, green, and blue, blue. And there's exactly three of them. So that's why there's six in this set, in the symmetric set, but only three in the anti-symmetric. Okay? All right, so um, if, I, if I take uh, representatives from the triplet state, what I find evaluating that color factor is if these quarks in, in this process are, are in the triplet state, then I get minus two-thirds. And then if they're in the sextet state, then I get one-third. So in the triplet state, this is attractive. And in the sextet state, this is repulsive. Okay? But that's only for two quarks. 
Okay? There's three in a baryon. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, I know that if I pick two of the quarks in the baryon, they have to be in a triplet state of their color assignments. So they have to be in one of these anti-symmetric combinations. Okay? But if I take these two and I say, these two quarks are in this particular triplet, that is not specifying the total color state of all three quarks. I still have to tell you what's up with that guy. Okay? The answer to the overall question of is the whole thing attractive or not is telling you about all three. So at the end of the day, when we do all three of these, we get another p nice piece of group representation calculus, and that is that three cross three cross three, which is Wolfgang. 27. Good. Is 10 plus eight plus eight plus one. Huh? It's close. What do you say? 27. Yeah. Okay, all right, good, good, good. Right. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so this is the totally anti-symmetric uh, decouplet. Yeah, I know. These are mixed. Okay, they have parts which are anti-symmetric and then parts which don't have an exchange symmetry. I'm not going to write them down. You can look them up in the notes. Um, oh, sorry, this is not anti-symmetric. This is totally symmetric. Okay, and then this guy, this one lone ranger, this is the totally anti-symmetric singlet. Okay, that is literally a state where we have uh, 1 over root 6 times every permutation of RBG with relevant minus signs. So that at the end of the day, if you take this whole thing and you switch any two colors, the whole thing comes back with a minus sign. That's what totally anti-symmetric means. Okay? And that state is written in the notes. Okay? And the bottom line is that it is only in this totally anti-symmetric singlet state that we find, if I focus on any two quarks, the interaction is attractive. Okay? If I pick one of these mixed states or the totally symmetric decouplet, if I pick this, one of these states for all three, if I focus on a pair, for some of those pairs it will be repulsive. For some it will be attractive, but for some it will be repulsive, and so we wouldn't expect a bound state. Okay? Say, say it again? You promise there's no bound states where you have two retractable. Okay, so 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 now now we come to the, the, the bottom line of all this, and that is um, we have we have provided suggestive calculations. Yeah. We have by no means rigorously proven anything. For example, we have not proved that you can't form a bound state if two of these are repulsive and all the other pair pairings are attractive. Okay. Worse still. We haven't proved that if you take a quark and an anti-quark in, in, in an octet state, for which you know, they shouldn't form a bound state, what we have not proved is that if they get far enough apart, they might start feeling an attractive force. Oh. Now you might start asking yourself, what? What are you talking about? Well, this is something that we're going to study in the last week of the class. But the bottom line is that um, Coupling constants, also known as charges, change when you change the distance or the energy scale on which you're considering processes. And for the strong interactions, we're going to discover in the last week of class a very unfortunate circumstance. And that is that at large distances, the strong interaction coupling is larger than one. It means that you can't use perturbation theory. Because if the coupling is larger than one, diagrams with higher vertices, higher number of vertices, count more. It means that the infinity of diagrams you're ignoring are the most important ones. That is where you run into a very serious problem in QCD. At large distances, which by the way is low energy, QCD is strongly coupled. 
So you can't even calculate this kind of quantity when you take a quark and an antiquark and separate them by a fair distance. Okay? It's only when they're very close together that you get this really strange behavior that QCD actually gets weak. That's what we call asymptotic freedom. As they get really close together, they don't even feel each other. It's exactly opposite of electromagnetism. I know! We'll support that with calculations at the end of the, at the, end of the semester when we study renormalization. <laughs> But, but, but bear in mind, so let's, let me just summarize what we've observed and let's sort of put, put on the table a proposal and for any of you who want to win the Nobel Prize, this is going to be your task, okay? So I want to I wanna impress on you, um, so a summary of our results so far are that quarks, appear in colorless singlet bound states. That is, if I want to create a bound state of quarks or quarks and antiquarks, they must always be in color singlet states. Okay? We, we haven't proved it, but we've got some evidence for it. Um, and on the other hand, gluons must exist in colorful octet states. Okay, and that's just because the gauge symmetry of QCD is SU3, not U3. If the gauge symmetry were U3, there would be one extra generator and it would actually correspond to the color singlet and that would look a lot like the photon. We don't observe that. So the blue ones must, must be the remaining generators of SU3, which are in these color octet states. And so the, these are two observations which we've kind of seen supported by calculation today and which is sort of just a, a byproduct of the structure of the symmetry group. And now I want to add two observations in physics, in, in the experiment. We have two observations. A. We never see free quarks. B, we never see gluons, free gluons. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, we can't take a meson and break it up into two quarks. We can take a hydrogen atom and break it up into a proton and an electron and get them far away from each other and are essentially free of each other. It is impossible to take a meson and break up the two quarks. It's impossible to take a baryon and break off one of the three quarks or break them all three free of each other. We simply cannot do it. Okay? Is there enough force or not enough energy? Well, we've never been able to do it, and there's going to be a, sort of a, some evidence for why that's the case. Okay? Moreover, uh, we've never seen a free gluon. This is different than QED. We see photons all the time. Okay, we have electrons make transitions in nuclei or in, in, in atoms, and when they do, they send out photons, which we can detect. If you have a meson, and it's got all these gluons inside, between, acting between the quarks, you never have one of those gluons just decide to pop out of the meson and fly off and hit your eyeball. It doesn't happen, okay? Both of these observations can be folded into a single hypothesis. And that hypothesis is called color confinement. And the color confinement is that any free or long-lived state in QCD must be a color singlet. Now, I, this is not proven, this is a hypothesis, but notice, if it's true, then it explains all of this. Because if you had a free quark, it would have color. It would not be a color singlet. I mean, if I had a quark, it would be like a red quark, and I could go, you're not a color singlet. In fact, you can't make a color singlet out of a single quark. It's impossible. So this confinement hypothesis is saying there are no free quarks. They must be bound up in mesons and baryons. It also tells you that you can't see a gluon 
because gluons are necessarily octet states. They're not color singlets, okay? This color confinement hypothesis is one of the most important outstanding problems in particle physics. If you can solve it, you can fly to Sweden and pick up your prize. Okay? It's still unproven. People that work in this, okay, typically have to resort to non-perturbative methods. So if you've ever heard of lattice QCD, this is doing exact QCD by discretizing space-time and doing the calculations exactly on a lattice instead of using perturbation theory. Some people have tried to bring in the tools of supersymmetry because supersymmetry often allows us to do exact calculations where perturbation theory would otherwise fail. Um, and then there's also ADS-CFT, okay? So there, there, there's, there's quite a few approaches which people are using to try and bring to this, but at this point, it's still unproven. Yeah? Are, are blue balls singlets? Can they like, form together and be singlets? And those can be colorless? Um, yes, yes. So bound states of blue balls. Uh, can, wait, can, can bound states of blue balls be singlets? Let me think for a second. Ooh, um, I would certainly think that you could get a bound state of blue, gall, blue, blue, blue balls that would be a singlet. But I, actually, I have to think about that because that sort of violates this, this hypothesis. We haven't observed blue balls. Right. right. Um, but it, so, so for those of you who don't know, this is an additional thing that happens in QCD that doesn't happen in QED. You know that in QED, photons do not interact with other photons. There's no vertex like that in QED, right. okay? But in QCD, we certainly have gluon-gluon vertices. But that means that you could imagine having gluons interacting with other gluons to the extent that they could form something like a bound state. It's like attractive interaction between gluons. Yeah, and, and so this, this bound state of gluons is something that's called a glue ball, all right? And there's no analog of this in, in electromagnetism. And, and then reportedly, you know, I don't know what it would take to generate one of these. There's questions about what does the QCD vacuum look like? Does it have glue balls? And I don't, I don't actually know the details of it at this point, but that's sort of where the glue ball story is coming from. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I want to take this and connect this back to a question that all of you should have been asking long ago, okay? And this is actually a really, it's a really nice illustration of how this gets applied. <laughs> And it's really just an application of this sort of color confinement hypothesis. So let's consider two protons, which are sitting there, you know, and they've got some reasonable separation. So there's my two protons. And we know protons are baryons. It's a combination of an up, up, down quark. And what I want to do is talk about the interaction between those two protons, OK? So um, if I modeled the interaction of the protons in terms of a gluon exchange, I could draw a diagram that looks like this. Okay, where all together this is a proton, this is a proton. Um, they both have two ups and a down. Maybe the down quarks in each one exchange a gluon. Okay, this is an allowed vertex in QCD. And then you get the same states coming out. So this would be a proton-proton interaction. Okay. And then I could compare that to what I know happens via QED, which is just photon exchange. All right? And I could break this up and talk about it happening between two quarks if I want, okay? Now, here's the thing. Um, this is order alpha strong squared, and this is order alpha electric squared. Okay, they'd each have two vertices, so they would each get a factor of the, of the coupling for that relevant interaction. I have two QCD vertices, so alpha S squared, two QED vertices, alpha E squared, okay? Everybody on board with what I'm saying? Yeah. Now here's the important observation. The strong coupling is larger than the weak coupling, which itself is larger than the electromagnetic coupling. 
Now, let's not worry about this. That's confusing. So let's just focus on this. Which of these two processes should be more important? The strong. The strong. Okay, it has a stronger coupling. If I take two protons and I separate them by a meter, I can measure the electromagnetic interaction between them, and I can guarantee you this interaction is going to be much, much stronger than the strong interaction between them, even though that name seems odd. Okay? So the puzzle is, why is it that electromagnetism dominates when, according to this, this representation of the, of the process, this should have a much larger amplitude than this. And the answer is that we're violating confinement. When these two things are separated by a large distance, okay, the gluon that's being exchanged is relatively long-lived. Okay, and, and long lifetime here, that's a concept which is always a, a, with respect to relative scales. But the important point is that for two largely separated protons, I cannot mediate a QCD interaction by the exchange of a gluon because a gluon is colorful. It's, a, it's an octet state. And the argument of confinement is that if these are swapping something, it needs to be a singlet. But now is a conundrum. How can the two protons exchange a singlet when there are no gluons that are singlets? Like, how can I have the proton exchange something with another proton that's not a photon? Because we know this happens with photons. It's got to exchange something that is a singlet. Why does it have to do that? Well, this is, the, this is, a, ref, this is a, a, a reflection of the, of the confinement hypothesis, which is that this is a long-range thing, and I'm looking at a long-lived intermediate particle. And the confinement hypothesis is that if it's long-lived, it needs to be in a color singlet. Okay, so just, just bear with me. This can't be a gluon. Yeah. What could it be? Gluon. What have we talked about today that live in color singlets? Mesons. Mesons. So let me actually show you how proton-proton interactions work. Fasten your seatbelts. I was kidding about that, but really. Here we go. So a proton-proton interaction is going to look something like the following. I'm going to have down, or sorry, up, up, down. I'll do down, up, up, and that will eventually give me the up, up, down, and the down, up, up. Clearly, this is a proton, this is a proton, this is a proton, this is a proton. Here we go. So this guy is going to come in, and he is going to have a vertex and have an outgoing red. That bird, that, this guy's going to come in with green, and he's going to have a vertex that is going to go out here with blue. This guy is going to come in red. He is going to have a vertex coming down that's blue. This is eventually going to become green. I'm going to have an incoming red. That's not a vertex, those are just crossing. I'm going to have an incoming blue. Oh, dar oh dear God, I hope I can do this without screwing up. And an incoming green. And now I've just got to connect everything. So my green connects with that guy. So I'm going to have a blue on here. It hits there. That's going to turn this into a blue. And then I'm going to have a glue on that connects these two. And I'm going to have a glue on which connects, uh, sorry, do, 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 do. Oh yeah, I'm going to have a glue on that comes down here. 
And then I have a green that comes out there. And then I'm going to have a blue that comes down to the red. And then the red is going to be connected via a glue on to here. Is that really what I want? No, that's a red. That's a red. There you go. Okay. So, I know, it's complicated. So let's, first of all, let's just make sure that what's going on makes sense. Uh, I have green, blue, red. This is a singlet proton. Green, blue, red, singlet proton. I got a singlet proton coming out. I got a singlet proton coming out. So everything is as it should be on the baryon side. Okay. However, what I'm exchanging is a down cork and an anti-down cork. That's a pi zero. Okay. So what we notice from this process, and again, this is just trying to get this to work using the hypothesis of color confinement, is we notice a few important things. The interaction of two protons, we should really not think about as the protons exchange a gluon, but rather they exchange a pi meson. Now, I want you to understand, this is all QCD. The vertices I'm drawing are gluon quark interactions. But in the early days of trying to explore nuclear interactions, people were modeling nucleon interactions, interactions between protons, protons, and protons, neutrons, as pi zero exchange. But now we understand why. Because it kind of is pi zero exchange. It's just there's a lot more complicated stuff going on in the nucleons to get you to that pi zero. So if you study the history of particle physics, you'll read a lot about pion mediated nuclear interactions. And then eventually the truth was told by QCD and these gross diagrams. Okay? The second very important observation is that this is an alpha to the eighth. Okay. Now alpha is bigger than alpha, alpha s is bigger than alpha e, but both presumably are less than one because we're doing perturbation theory and I'm raising this to the eighth power. So an eighth order diagram is generally going to be a lot less important than a second order diagram, even if the couplings are different by a little bit. They'd have to be really, really different for this to somehow be more important. Okay. By the way, if I wanted to calculate what this would look like for protons and neutrons, okay, I could just switch this to a down. And that's the diagram. No, leave that enough. Okay? It doesn't change anything. So the same process will describe the attraction between protons and neutrons, but of course the good thing for protons and neutrons is you can't really compete with it with an electromagnetic interaction. Okay, so this is why you get more stable nuclei by shoving more and more neutrons into the nucleus. Okay, you shove more protons in, you've got to deal with that electromagnetic repulsion. They do have a strong force attraction, the protons with each other, through this diagram. But if you throw neutrons in, they're just adding to the attractive love. Okay, they're not adding any of the repulsive electromagnetic stuff. Yeah, Nathan. Yeah, so we can still assume that the alpha for the strong force is less than one, even though we're at like long distances. I don't think we were. So, so the, 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 the alpha is relevant for these parts of the diagram. Oh, which are this is all small. This is, this is the scale yeah. of the size of a nucleon, the, the size of a proton. It's 10 to the minus 15 meters. This separation is the large part. And that's just like a pi meter. Like pi yeah. Okay, so I just want to, so, so this is sort of our explanation for why the strong force is less important than the electromagnetic force at large distances. It's just because the diagrams are complicated. And again, this kind of comes from this color confinement hypothesis, which is not proven. Okay, now I just want to throw one last idea at you because it's really cute. And that is, um, before this was really understood, and even before the sort of standard version of color confinement, 
people were trying to argue. They said, you know what, those, those protons are made of something. We know they are because we're banging into them and they're kind of wiggling like they've got three things inside of them. But we can't for the life of us get them apart. Same with the mesons when they could create mesons. So there were people who said, you know what, maybe this happens. Maybe if I take two quarks or a quark anti-quark or whatever and I pull them apart, something magical happens. So let's first of all think of what happens to electromagnetic field lines when I have two charged particles, okay? We know if we draw the field lines, then we get this nice pattern, which you've all seen in your classes before, for the electromagnetic field lines between two charged particles, okay? And then they said, what if when I separate two quarks, whatever force is acting between them that's not electromagnetic, that's the strong force, what if the field lines are collecting themselves into a bundle that somehow collapsed between the two of them? They don't spread out like electromagnetic field lines. Okay. Now, with QCD, we know that this kind of makes sense because the gluons, if these are gluon lines, the gluons actually interact with each other. So we can imagine the gluon lines grabbing each other and pulling themselves together. Light glue. Light glue. <laughs> Okay. If you can invent repulsive glue, you'll probably also win the prize. Okay, so, so the idea here is that maybe the explanation for why we can't separate quarks is because the strong interaction, when you try and pull them apart, is collapsing to a tube between them, and a tube has tension. If you pull harder, you raise the energy. That's opposite of what you have in electromagnetism. The further apart you get them, the lower energy you're going. If you collapse everything to a tube, the further you pull it apart, the larger the energy. So that would explain why you can't pull them apart. So people hypothesized this, and they studied the dynamics of these tubes. Now these tubes are 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's the size of a meson, okay? Or a proton, if you don't want a baryon. And when they studied these tubes, they found, they were trying to explain the strong interactions, okay? They found two problems. One is that the fluctuations of these tubes were tachyonic. They were actually fluctuating in a way that would make you think the tube was moving faster than the speed of light. And secondly, if you think about the excitations of the tube, you actually found that there was a spin two excitation. Okay. Now, there was no observed spin two particle. Like you can't like we, we observe all these spin one particles and spin zero particles, so, or spin one particles and spin half particles. But there was no spin two particle. Okay. So eventually, quantum chromodynamics was developed just a couple of years later, and everybody's like, you don't have to think about these tubes. We've got chromodynamics. We've got renormalization, which we'll talk about the last week. We don't have to think about these tubes. But there were a couple of people who said, you know what? This is actually useful because that guy right there is a graviton. So what they did was they took this and they shrunk the length of these tubes down to 10 to the minus 38 meters. <laughs> right? Sorry, 35. <laughs> so they did, they did two things. They shrunk the length scale down to 10 to the minus 35 meters, and they added supersymmetry. And when they added supersymmetry, it got rid of the tachyon. And in doing so, what did they discover? Science. String theory. <laughs> so this is where string theory was born. They were trying to explain why you can't separate quarks. Their explanation in terms of these color flux tubes kind of worked, but then it had these problems. Eventually though, QCD came out and everybody ignored it, except for a few people at Caltech were like, this is really interesting, and they kept working on it, and they finally fixed this problem, and at that point, that was the birth of string theory. All right? Yeah, Rochelle. Um, what people were those? What people? They kept working. So John Schwartz was one, and um, I want to say Michael Green. Not Brian Green, but Michael Green. 
So Green and Schwartz are the two names that are associated with these early. Uh, Seskind is also associated with early string theory ideas, but Green and Schwartz were the two who, after everyone else had abandoned it, they kept working. And they were the ones who started eventually finding these incredibly lucky cancellations, so that, for example, the tachyons went away, there were a lot of anomalies in the theory which canceled for certain dimensions, and so forth and so on. So, yeah. All right, thanks you guys. I'll see you on Tuesday of next week. You have a homework assignment. It's got one problem there now, and I'll be adding to it. Oh, <laughs> my